One of those shows a lot of people have vague memories of. I watched it as a kid, but barely remember anything about it. There was a shadowy figure that looked like Zatch they never named or explained, and Ponygon never found his partner. But that was about it. I don't even think I ever saw the end of the series. And as it turns out, there was really no way for me to have done so. Toonami only aired 77 of the 150 episodes. And on top of that, the entire show wasn't even dubbed. So even if you saw the 150 episodes, you wouldn't have seen the ending. That's not gonna bode well, is it? Anyways, years go by and I come across this in a GameStop. Oh cool, a Zatch Bell game. I know of Momoto Fury, but never seen this one before. It's so cheap, so I guess I'll grab it. Maybe it'll answer some of the questions I have about the show. Took it home, played it, beat it. Remember almost nothing from it. And then years go by and I'm upgrading all my disc-only games to CIB copies. And yeah, I upgraded this one, so now I have everything that goes with it. But why can't I remember this? Why is everything this IP touches such a mystery to me? Surely there's something to this, right? It's stayed with me for so long. Hell, I even have the game's OST on my MP3 player. But outside of recognizing it, this IP leaves almost no impact on me. Let's find out what's going on here. So in case it's not obvious, this is a tie-in game for the American dubbing of the Japanese anime. This was smack dab in the era of video game tie-ins. It was mainly reserved for movies, but a lot of anime and cartoons got them too. Quality may vary. The main one I remember is the Naruto Clash of Ninja games for GameCube, which, if I can be honest, are pretty lit. Momoto Battles is pretty similar, if simplified, but we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves. As I do when covering tie-in games on this channel, we're gonna go over the source material, i.e. why this exists in the first place. Again, the Zatch Bell American dub is to blame. And rest assured, this dub is garbage. So I know Four Kids was the poster child for completely shredding Japanese to American adaptations during this era, but Viz Media also did it. Yeah, that's right, Viz Media is responsible for this mess. They got the foreign rights to the series and then contracted Studioopolis to make the adaptation. Yeah, they adapted it alright. The North American English dub has been edited and localized for young children aged 6 to 10 years in America. 6 to 10 years in America. 6 to 10 years. Oh boy. Now that alone is going to affect the overall product a significant amount. Like comparable 4Kids retranslations, they have to boil down complex concepts to something more simplified as well as needing to censor things that may not be alright to show American kids. After all, Japan gets away with quite a lot and- HOLY SHIT! They didn't waste any time, did they? I think the most infamous of Zatch Bell's censorship is this, uh... What, what, what is this even supposed to be? I know it's a censored shotgun, but what is this supposed to look like? It looks like anal beads. The funny thing is even they knew this was garbage and later reruns of the show replaced it with this laser gun that while still being censorship, looks a lot better. Reminder, that's just three episodes in and doesn't even cover all the dialogue changes. And boy, are there some doozies. There's all the typical ones like no kill, no death, ETC. I mean, they have to take things out. It's for kids. Just look at this nice song we have here. Hey, hey, let's dance all day. Hey, hey, let's dance all day. Boing, boing. Hey, hey, let's dance all day. Boing, boing. Boogie, boogie, boogie. Yeah, did I mention this song was originally about melons? Oi, oi, boku no CD ga hoshi itte. Ora, uke tori na. Present to suru no wa Falco Falco sa. ちょ、もげ。パルコフォルゴレ。仕方ないな。踊ってあげるよ。パルコフォルゴレ。ちちちちおっぱい。ボインボイン。ちちちちおっぱい。ボインボイン。もげ、もげ、もげ。わお。So, yeah, the dub for this isn't very good, but at the same time, I don't see how they could bring this over without completely butchering it. And look, I'm not trying to act like this is high art or anything, it's a battle shonen, but I still think when you dub something, you should try to keep the original artistic intent, which the dub of Zatch Bell doesn't 
do. If you care that much about Zatch Bell, just watch the sub. I can't even really go that in depth because I'm afraid YouTube would shut me down. But hey, that's perfect. We're not really here for the anime. I'm just trying to give you proper context to why this thing exists in the first place. So, let's get started. I'm gonna go ahead and jump right into the story mode, but before that, we gotta explain how this game works. This is a 3D fighting game that plays similar to the Naruto games I mentioned previously. The main goal is to reduce your opponent's HP to zero and win the match. You've got a basic attack combo for the Momoto you play as by slamming B, and you can guard by holding X. If you guard at the right moment, you can stun the attacker. Some characters have an attack for pressing back and B, but pressing forward and B lets you and your partner do a combo attack, which is good for building spell power. Spell power gets expended when you cast spells with A, which are powerful attacks and the main way to win battles as they're a fantastic counter for physical attacks. You usually get a basic attack spell with neutral A, but forward A and back A can also perform different spells. Pressing up and B will usually get you into the air to launch a spell attack at the opponent, while pressing X at the right time will allow you to cast a shield that will expend some spell power, but will only work against spells. When your spell power is built up enough, your ultimate spell opens for a single use. You can cast it by clicking L to initiate the windup, but you need to be careful because opponents can interrupt it. If successful, you'll cast your ultimate spell, which drains all of your spell bar in most cases. Before your attack connects with the opponent, they have the ability to guard and lessen damage. If the opponent has spell power available, they can cast a more powerful guard to try and save themselves. However, this is rarely worth it to me as it completely empties the spell gauge regardless of how much spell power you actually have. If both players initiate an ultimate wind up at the same time, a showdown will commence. In this state, both characters mash A to see whose spell will break through the other to deal damage. Neither player is able to guard in this state before the attack hits, meaning showdowns can make or break matches. If both players' powers are evenly matched, the showdown will end in a draw and actually leave both players with a small amount of spell power? I'm not really sure what that's about. But yeah, for the most part, that's it. This game is very simple, and it might seem as if I'm focusing on this a bit too much, but it'll come into play later. Back to the story mode, it's a kinda a cool idea. Basically you get different stories to explore as a single, static character for each run. You're given a set list of locations you can visit and hopefully engage in battles to advance the story. I say hopefully because there's no clear indicator of where you actually need to go. So if you go to an area you don't need to visit, hmm. well, he's there. Oh well, let's go somewhere else. You know, the messed up part is I'm not even exaggerating that much. The fights within story mode aren't usually anything special, so instead let's talk about how bad the cutscenes are. You get these before and after each fight, and boy, are they something. No, it was actually pretty easy. Why is his voice mix so low? That boy is from the Momoto world. We're battling over the throne of the king. As long as you stay with that boy, you will be forced to fight. You should part ways before he puts you in danger. Okay, no, really, why is the voiceover track volume mixing so inconsistent? Look, I know my audio mixing is shit. I'm sure it's still gonna be shit in this video because I just don't understand how to do it correctly yet. But this was something that got released for money. I do this for free. How could you release it like this? So yeah, despite the fact this game has the voice actors from the series, the writing is worse than the actual shows is. When characters pop up, they usually exposition dump in really lazy ways. While I'm gonna argue this is objectively bad, does it really matter? To me it does slightly because I've seen other games do this correctly. Yes, there are tie-in fighting games for battle shonens with decent dialogue and voice direction. And I think in this game's case, it gets it worse than normal because you're technically getting a watered down adaptation of a watered down adaptation. And we haven't even seen the worst of it yet. There are so many things I've never seen before! Hey, Zatch! Don't stare so much! Don't you know that's embarrassing? Look, Kyo! A horse! A horse is coming! Matter? Oh my god. It's... him. Okay, so this guy right here is the entire reason I bought this game. Let's see what... Why do they say he has a book on his bet? Oh. <sighs> 
So this little guy is called Ponygon, and like I said, he is one of the main reasons I bought this game. Now, when this game was released in the US on October 19th, 2005, Toonami had only aired up to episode 30. Ponygon had technically been introduced by then as Datch's friend, but he doesn't get his partner until episode 65, which aired an entire year later. So by that logic, I can understand why he appears in this game like this. I mean, not only is that a pretty big spoiler, but at this point in the anime, this is how he was. So, let's go over all the characters that hadn't been introduced yet that this game spoils. Why? Now, to be fair to the game, we did get Bari and Gustav in their place, which, believe it or not, are actually exclusive to the US version. I wish I had known this beforehand because I barely played as them while capturing footage for this video, but in all seriousness, that is kind of cool. I'm glad that even if they have to take things out, it is being replaced with something else. While researching, I read up on them and found out their relationship is meant to be a representation of a strict father and a rebellious son, which is something Zatchville explores a little bit that I actually like, the relationship between the Momoto and their partners. Momoto are almost useless on their own and need partners to read their spell books and cast spells, and all of the relationships for each team in the series feels believable and varied. That doesn't mean they're represented well in this game though. Outside of this single instance, I can't think of any others that stood out to me. Why? Why am I losing to a kid that looks so weak? Hey you, what are you fighting for, kid? To become a kind king. I'm fighting to become a kind king so that nobody will be forced to fight anymore and so that a battle like this will never be fought again. This is why you lost, man. A fight is not just for the sake of winning. There needs to be a purpose. That's something that you don't have. I don't like this, but I'll let this one battle go. Next time you see me, this won't happen. So I'd like to clarify what I mean here a little bit. What I am talking about is, yes, the characters' personalities and the dialogue they say does usually reflect what is canon within the show, but it's the situation where that dialogue is said or those specific character traits are brought up that don't really make sense. Like this one with how they chose Ponygon's name, not only is it not why his name was chosen, but it, it just feels random, it doesn't fit. Because you're like a horse and I wanted you gone, your name will be Ponygon. <laughs> this conversation with Barry, Gustav, Zatch, and Keo is not only consistent with what happens in the show, but it actually makes sense within the context of this game, which most dialogue segments don't bother to do. All right, that, that's enough of talking about the show for now. As I said, Barry and Gustav are exclusive to the US version, so let's take a look at Ponygon and Kafka Sunbeam in the Japanese version. <laughs> Dude, look how cute he is. I want to play as the horsey. So, yeah, we're stuck with Ponygon without his partner, meaning he has no spells and is demoted to a bit of a joke character. He's also kind of weird to unlock, but we'll get to that later. Yeah, Zatch. Me too. Alright, let's get back to the game. Hmm. Well, he's there! Oh, that's real nice. 
After that, you do a fight against Barry and Juan Ray with nothing really notable other than some really, really bad writing. But then shit hits the fan. This is it. The forest where Dad found you. Well, what's the matter, Zatch? I don't know, but I'm shaking. I can't stop shaking. I used to live here. And then... Who is it? Zatch, is that you? You lost your memory. Why are you here again? Zatch, ready? Yeah! Mm. Oh, hum. <laughs> so back when I first played this game, I remember this particular fight being very brutal. But they went down pretty easy for me this time. Don't worry, we'll come back to these two. This might seem like a good place for story mode to stop, but we're not done yet. After that, Keo and Zatch head back to Japan and... Wait, you mean to tell me that those blank areas can have random things in them sometimes? I guess that's kinda nice, it does encourage exploration, but I'm gonna argue it's bad design because it incentivizes the player to waste time constantly checking different areas for scraps. At least it's not mandatory. It feels like they slapped a band-aid on a not very well thought out mechanic. The next fight is against Kiddo and Dr. Riddles, which is honestly pretty tough and for the first time forced me to go into a three round tiebreaker, which again, shows the game's difficulty is starting to climb. After that, we get the last fight for story mode, and boy, do I actually have a lot to say about this one. The final fight is against Zophis, who is controlling his partner Coco. I really think he's where the difficulty of this game steps up, because if you don't understand how to counter what he does, the game will effectively wall you. Remember how I mentioned up and B will get you up in the air to do a special attack? For Zatch and a lot of characters, this results in your partner grabbing hold of you and throwing you up into the air in a scripted segment and casting a spell. For Zophis, however, he levitates into the air, meaning most attacks won't even hit him. While in the air, his spell power will steadily drain, but he's still able to launch spell attacks at you that will be difficult to dodge. He's even able to charge his ultimate attack from up there, with no obvious way for you to counter it. So, how do you beat him? This seems pretty broken, right? At first, yeah, but if you know how the different spells work, it's pretty easy to counter. It's likely you haven't noticed this, but Zatch's standard A spell, Zakair, can actually home in on opponents. Opponents are usually on the same X, Y, Z axis as you, so you'll rarely see this. Here, Zophis is levitating in the air, moving along the Z axis, meaning that you only have three attacks that can reach him. The two different Zakairs you can perform with neutral A or up and B, and your ultimate spell, which will hit anything on the field regardless of where they're at. I find it a lot easier to knock him back down to earth using your up and B personally. Even when knowing that, the fight is still hard, but it will make it a little bit easier. Once you beat him, the credits will roll. You unlock Juan Ray and Lian and Kiddo and Dr. Riddles, as well as a mistranslation. Your hard work will also earn you some points. So yeah, that's Zatch Bill Mamoto Battles. Don't forget to leave a like and subscribe. <laughs> uh... No, we're not done. In fact, we've really only scratched the surface of this game. I have a particular disdain for reviewers that will barely play any of a game and then feel like they have the authority to speak on behalf of it. Or, you know, just flat out lie. I personally try not to give out ratings or opinions on games I haven't finished or haven't seen most of unless it's something I really really hate and know for a fact does not get any better. My own personal morals also don't let me abandon games half finished unless, again, I find I have no interest in them. I mean, I paid money for this game. I better get my money out of it otherwise it's a waste. And that's how I do things here. We're gonna go through everything this game has to offer. Within reason, of course. So buckle up because you're in for the long haul. Let's start by taking a look at that password we unlocked. As I expected, yes, that unlocked screen for password was a mistranslation. What we actually unlocked was a password option in bonus mode. Yeah, we don't have any passwords, so let's take a look at the internet. One of the things I love the most about playing older titles is the amount of documentation for them online. In most cases, people have already figured out how to get everything, meaning there's little to no guesswork. You can often find entire guides covering every nook and cranny of a game. And sadly, that is not the case here. 
Holy shit, there's so much misinformation online for this game. I'm gonna be bringing this up here and there for the duration of this video, but for now, let's take a look at these passwords. As far as I know, there's only three of them, which originally came on cards that were included with the game if you purchased it new. I don't have these, obviously. Entering the CZ ball will unlock Lila and Albert. Ukachet will give you 300 points, and whatever the fuck this is gives you 100. Wait, what? But this site says the CZ ball unlocks Victorim and Mohawk Ace, and Ukachet will give me 10 random cards. What the hell's going on here? I'm jumping ahead a little bit but I want to get this out of the way. I tested this and here's what the passwords actually do and I have footage to back up what I say. The CZ ball will normally unlock Lila and Albert or give you 100 points if they're already unlocked. You normally get them by buying cards in bonus mode which we'll go over in a sec. As far as I can tell, Ukachet will always give you 300 points but I think it might give you Kiddo and Dr. Riddles or Wandering Lien if there's some way to unlock password mode without also unlocking both of them. Again, I got all three of those by beating Zatch's story mode, so I'm unsure if it's possible. Lastly, George Clooney will give you either 100 points or 10 random cards. Yeah, I'm not sure about this one as it appears random, but I'm gonna spoil a bit for you. Don't use the CZ ball till after you have Lila and Albert, so it'll give you 100 points. And shut off autosave and save before doing George Clooney, and reload if it doesn't give you the 10 cards. Trust me, you wanna do this because it's gonna save you a lot of time. And speaking of time, it's time to talk about the other two parts of bonus mode, card shop and card gallery. So you know how I mentioned points earlier? Yeah, these are Momoto points which you spend in the card shop. For 10 points, you can start up a roulette of sorts and get a random card from the Zatch Bell TCG. Yes, the real world Zatch Bell TCG. That's uh, weird. I mean, I've seen ideas like this in other games. Bleach Blade of Fate had a card system that would allow you to gain certain effects when tapped during fights, but the cards weren't the literal cards from the Bleach TCG. They were their own thing. In this game, all you can really do with them is view them, and they have no actual effect on the game, except some unlocks are hidden behind them. In the Japanese version, this was much more prominent as specific cards would unlock specific things, but thankfully in this American version, all the stages are already unlocked and you get the unlockables by buying the entire set of cards. Which yes, you have to buy all of these cards. This is why I gave you that warning on how to use the password. Sadly, this requires grinding in the end, but at the same time, not really. I just completed other things I hadn't done already in the game and got enough to buy all the cards. You get Victorine for buying the entire red card set, Melordo Z and Coco for yellow, Lila and Albert for green. The blue set doesn't unlock anything on its own, but once you have all four sets completed, you will get Lila and Albert waking, which might sound weird, but I'll explain later. The problem here is that while I think this is better than the Japanese version, it takes a lot of points to get all of them. And each time you do the roulette to get a new one, you can actually get cards you already own, meaning you just wasted time and points. However, I will say this, the roulette does seem a bit forgiving, but if you're gonna have it be that reliable, why even have a roulette in the first place? Why didn't they do the way they handled trophies in Melee? I just don't understand. This, this mechanic feels half-baked. So yeah, this is pretty stupid. You can't do anything with these cards except view them, so it feels like a disingenuous way to promote the TCG. At least we're done with it. Let's move on. On the next all-new episode of Zatch Bell, Keo and Zatch head out to see if they can make the third spell work. Here goes nothing to care dog! I guess nothing happens. Hmm. A nice Momoto battle may be just the thing to get the juices flowing. Full speed ahead! An all-new episode of Zatch Bell, Saturday at 9.30 p.m. Uh, it's good to be the king. Let's beat this joker! <laughs> Only Toonami. Get him! <laughs> At this point, I was just trying to unlock everything and complete things I didn't already do. I did most of these while grinding out points to buy cards. I'm gonna cover the other story modes first. They all play out the same way as Zatch's, so there's really only a few things to say. Tia's story mode is very basic. She plays a lot like Zatch, but with a focus on defensive spells. She's got this nice one that can replenish HP, which no other character in the game can do. Clearing Tia's story mode unlocks Wanrays, and that's it. There's really not much else to say than that, so let's move on. Contrame's story is pretty difficult, but only because he's a very hard character to learn. Unlike every other character, Contrame's spells generally don't deal damage, 
and leave you playing more defensively. I think most people would argue he's a bad character, and while he is difficult to play as, his story mode is honestly a lot of fun. I genuinely like him and Fulgore's characters as well as their relationship they have being kind of sweet. We did it, Fulgore! We won! The invincible of Fulgore and the unbeatable Concho Man! While fighting as Concho Man, you'll have to rely on his partner attack a lot, which is hilarious. <laughs> You're basically forced to try and build as much spell power as possible so you can use his neutral ace spell, Peruk, and his ultimate spell. His other spells can be useful, but like I said, they play more on the defensive side, and I'm not really into that. Freezing opponents in place, making Mimoto attack their partners instead, ETC. Sounds cool, but IMO, it's not that fun to do in practice unless you can read the opponent's moves really well. Ah shit, I lost. Fugare! <laughs> Oh my god, look at his face. Contramay's story is all about being Zatch, which is kind of refreshing since they aren't after the bad guys. Brago's story is again much of the same, to the point where I actually didn't take any notes on this section of the game. So I'm going to take this opportunity to talk about some brief plot stuff from the anime. Remember how I mentioned this game includes a lot of characters that I'd consider spoilers? That's because they're involved in the ancient Momoto arc. See, Zophus is controlling his partner Coco against her will. And later on, he discovers ancient Momoto in some ruins that he brings back to life, and then brainwashes their partners to be under his control too. We only get two of them in this game, being Victorim and Mohawk Ace, and Lila and Albert. Which, I would argue, is actually a major spoiler, because Lila and Albert waking shows that Albert breaks free of Zophus' control at some point. Anyways, Coco is Sherry's best friend. Sherry partnered with Brago so she could save Coco, and in return, will help make him king. And that's all Brago's story mode is about, saving Coco. Now you would think that with a character relationship like that, they might, you know, reflect that a little bit in their pre-battle quotes, right? It would add a bit of characterization to the game, which is pretty cool. Represents the license a little bit better, you know what I'm saying? Now, Brago! <sighs> Let's have some fun while you become king. <laughs> nope! Each character has exactly two possible pre-battle quotes and two victories. And they don't change. They're just random. So this game was developed by a company called Aiding. I bring this up because they were also responsible for the Naruto games I mentioned previously. In those games, characters will have a different pre-battle quote based on the matchup that's happening. I've been, I've been waiting, waiting for this. For this. I, I want to fight you. Be nice. Let's go. Sensei, treat me to ramen if I win. I'm not going to go easy on you. Now I know what you're thinking. But PSP man, this Naruto game you're showing footage from is horrible and has barely any content. Of course it's gonna have small details. They had more time to polish it. Yes, you are correct. But it's in every Clash of Ninja game, including Revolution 2, which has so many characters I don't even have them all unlocked yet. But more importantly, three different Clash games came out with this feature before this Zatch Bell game did. Okay. Well, maybe they didn't have the budget and cut corners. You know, I, I could see that. But I'm going to argue that this was not the thing they should have cut. Because I find it funny that you would cut something that gives characterization and showcases relationships between characters in a game based on an IP that has a focus on character relationships. Having this in there would literally make this a better representation of the IP. What is the point of a licensed game that doesn't even bring life to that world through the realm of video games? And you know what? I think they knew that. I think they understood that the bond Momoto formed with their partners is important. Because there's a game mode I haven't talked about yet, and it's going to be the absolute last thing I do. Because it is easily the worst, most lazily designed part of this game. The final story mode we have access to right now is Wanrei's. Wanrei's story replaces Ponygons from the Japanese version. Again, I'm really sad they're cutting things out I'd want to play but it's nice to see they're filling the void somehow. 
Sadly, it's this American Adaptations team that's doing the writing now, rather than translating it, so... Leanne! Wanray! Zatch! Kyo! Why are you here in England? My father didn't send you after me, did he? Wanray! You didn't stand up to fate and obstacles? Kyo... If you can't do that, where is the king in you? If you run from fate, what are your dreams? Isn't that what I told you? <gasps> Kyo... Won't you battle me? Yeah, it's uh, it's it's really it's really bad. Thankfully, it's mercifully short. However, Wanrei is broken. Yeah, Wanrei might lack range attacks, but he's so friggin' fast. It's really easy to win as him. He's almost completely imbalanced. I mean, look at this. Look at this. His story mode also does something really stupid by having three consecutive fights take place in the exact same location. However. I will point out one single element of good design here. Well, uh, relatively good design. So the game has taught you to check every area for either a fight or points. And while I still think this is a stupid mechanic, the game does do something pretty genius in this specific case. Now after every fight, your cursor will automatically be placed at the top of the list of places to go. Meaning, you'll likely select the very first one. And if you do so after doing a single fight in one race story, what are you? Leanne, get behind me. One Ray, let us try to do our best together as a team. Okay, Leanne. You need to help me win, Kyo! You got it, Zatch! <laughs> Round one! Fight! Zakaga! What the heck is that? This is a powered up character. Every single selectable character has one. I don't believe they do more damage or have increased stats in any way. However, they are gold and are much faster than their standard counterparts. They sound intimidating at first and can be if you don't know what you're doing. Beating one makes them selectable on the character select menu. Now I've ragged on this game quite a bit, but I do believe this is actually good game design. You have this really broken character you're playing as for this mode. And due to its placement, this will likely be the first powered up character you'll encounter, as it's in a very easily accessible spot. And if you happen to lose, it's really easy to fight him again. I believe this was done intentionally by the designers because it's Zatch, the main character for this property. Introducing these character types now, when we're most of the way through the story, makes the player question if they've missed other ones previously. Which, yes, you did. Personally, I think this is a great way to introduce these powered up characters and motivate the player to want to find more. So yeah, good job guys, you did it. Congratulations. 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 Oh, I guess I still haven't unlocked the last story mode yet. Maybe I need to fill out the Momoto book. That that's a thing, right? So I'm gonna I'm gonna be pretty blatant here. This part sucks. Basically, when you play through story mode, there's going to be fights you'll miss, and getting them is annoying and horribly inconsistent. You'll have to choose to visit specific areas after doing specific fights in a specific order, otherwise you won't be able to access them until you restart the story from the beginning. I only needed two of them, and despite the fact I literally used a guide beat by beat for this so I knew exactly where they were and how to encounter them, it took me 38 minutes and multiple tries. Yes. It really is that much of a pain in the ass. And oh look, it got me nothing. Cool. Okay, What what's left? I haven't really looked at time attack at all. Time attack is literally just a time attack mode. Basically you fight 10 opponents and try to see how fast you can clear all of them. As far as I know, there's only three unlockables here, being two stages, and finally, <sighs> Pony gone. Actually, Ponygon's unlock method is kind of cool. Instead of fighting Zophis as the final fight, you'll fight him at Mochinoki Middle School, which I haven't mentioned yet, is my favorite stage thanks to the music. Yashin! Victorine! Model, 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 model. Round one! <laughs> yeah, you get him, Ponygon. Two. Oh, yeah, you go, 
little dude, but I need to unlock you, so... Sorry. Hurrah! We win, Mohican Ace! You know, with that, we're only missing one character still. I wonder how you get the last one. Maybe beating that star- Oh. I, I still don't have it? What's even left to do at this point? Alright, I'm gonna check online. Zatch Bell! Enjoy. Yeah, that was fucking stupid. You wanna know how you do this? So there's two codes to unlock the final character in his story, and they are on the very last page of the game's manual. You know, I'm kinda okay with that. I mean, it does incentivize kids to read, and that's who this American adaptation is aimed at. Plus, if I can be honest, I believe the manga is actually a lot better than the anime in this case. It's, it's usually the case, let's be real here. But I'm an adult, I don't need to cheat, so let's unlock this stuff for real. What? What do you mean that's the real way to unlock it? Yeah. This is how you unlock this. There's no other way. Imagine buying this game secondhand without the manual or just never reading it anyways. I know this was the era where game manuals were still necessary, but it's not like this game is super complicated. Hell, I didn't read it till halfway through making this video and that was just to see what was inside of it. At least we now have access to the final character and his story. I can see the finish line in sight. So let's knock this out and get things wrapped up. So this little ball of edge is called Zeno. He's Zatch's evil twin brother from the Momoto world. Dun, 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 dun. And yes, that is a dumb trope, and one I don't understand why so many shonens reuse. It's either the evil twin brother or bad recolor of the main character. And for some reason, Zatch Bell decided to do both. And as lame as that may be, we have more pressing matters to get to. So we have to discuss a pretty major point from the source material really quick. The entire premise of this series is that 100 Momoto children are sent to the human world to find a partner and battle other Momoto until only one remains, where they will be crowned king of the Momoto world. You knock other participants out of the tourney by burning their book, which when this happened for the first time in the show, was actually a pretty powerful moment. Whoa, what a spell. It took their attack and reflected it right back, with some kind of lightning attack thrown in as a bonus. Huh? Hey, you okay, little guy? Huh? Huh? Ah! 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 Hey, you'll get burned! I, I can't put it out! It won't go out! His book. No, He's trying to save it. No, What's happening to him? Book, Wait, something's going on. Book. Leave it alone. Uh. Is he gone? Raycom! When his spell book went, he went with it. Zeno's story is the only time in this game that burning the opponent's book actually gets referred to, although indirectly. Zeno gets access to a bunch of locations at once, and his story consists of running around essentially murdering everyone to surprisingly uplifting music. Not even a warm up. What a boring battle. Well, then, to the final blow! Wait. There's something you have to do for us. Will you lend us your power? Ridiculous. The loser must disappear. Those are the rules. Doctor! Kiddo, I'm sorry. I'll bring down everyone. Come on, amuse me a little bit. Yeah, that's uh, kind of an odd choice. The story mode's game over music is much more fitting, but I guess they did this so it wouldn't scare kids. <laughs> Z 
Zeno's final fight is against Zatch, where he doesn't burn his book because he wants him to suffer. Believe it or not, but this is actually something he does in the show, and this story mode, while non-canon and hypothetical, actually represents this character accurately. Why now? I find it so odd they chose to represent this character so well, yet skipped out on every other story mode. And with that, we finished. Oh, wait, it looks like we missed a book entry. Yeah, really. I played through Zeno's story mode using a guide the entire time and still missed one. Absolutely ridiculous. You'd think of all of the story modes, this one wouldn't have that problem. So with the story book completed, what are we rewarded with? Nothing! Well, at least I was rewarded with nothing. I didn't do this myself because it required me to play story mode more, and in all seriousness, I was just burnt out on it. But apparently filling the book completely causes powered up Zeno to spawn in Zatch's story. Again, I can't personally confirm this, but it sounds right to me. Also, I didn't mention it earlier, but there's a special powered up version of Time Attack where you fight only powered up characters. I unlocked it at the same time as Powered Up Tia, but I'm not entirely sure how or why I unlocked it then, as nothing I saw online suggested I should have. This mode might seem unbeatable, but here's me doing it with normal Layla. I actually enjoyed this mode a lot, as it forced me to pay attention to what I was doing and strategize to win. I even found myself having to take fights to the third round and get the win there, as well as choosing to not defend and take hits from ultimate attacks just so I could keep my spell power for the next round and use it to get the KO. This was honestly really fun, and this mode does an excellent job showing off how well the gameplay is built by forcing you to fully understand the game's mechanics to win. And I know I've been rather harsh, but the core gameplay of this game is honestly really solid despite the simplicity. The presentation, sound design, and especially the music are major highlights. For some reason, this game doesn't have a sound test, which is really sad because the music is easily the best part of this game. Now that I've talked about the major positives this game has, it's time to talk about the absolute worst this game has to offer. Develop Mode. So remember how I was harping on them for not representing character relationships all that well? Develop Mode is their very literal interpretation of that concept, and sadly it requires more grinding so is that a powered up Wanray? <laughs> So yeah, 
once you're done milking time attack for all it's worth, you pick out your preferred Mamoto. As you can see, I've chosen Kiddo here. And you use the points in your possession to increase their stats. Here's what level 0 looks like. Here's what level 1 looks like. And here's what max level looks like. In total, to get max level, it takes 2,130 points. For every single character. Alright, look. This is dumb. This mode doesn't add anything interesting to the game, and it's not used to augment the gameplay in an interesting way, so I don't really have much to say about it. It's kind of pointless. Yeah, it's neat to power up your favorite character for the first time, but there's no appeal beyond that, and to actually fully complete it takes so much time grinding and time, it's not worth it. Especially since, as far as I can tell, you don't get anything for doing so. I find this mode to be a waste. I would have much rather preferred a unique battle mode with a twist or something. Not this literal interpretation of one of this IP's best concepts. And with that, We've seen all the unique content this game has to offer. I haven't exactly done everything, there's quite a few powered up characters I missed. But we've seen everything that isn't new. Well, except for one. So while I was editing this video, I actually made a post to the Zatch Bell subreddit letting people know this video was coming. And this person contacted me with a ton of information about this game and this series. All of which I'm not going to be able to use in this video, but we'll get to that a little bit later. However, they did tell me about this special attack that's in the game, but is never told to the player, which looks like this. Zeno is also capable of using this spell. You do this by starting the control stick in the up position, and spinning it all the way around and ending with it pointing in the direction of the enemy and pressing A. It's kind of difficult to do, but you can get a hang on it eventually. It is guaranteed to hit the enemy if you launch it, and while it doesn't do any damage itself, it will double the damage of your next attack. From what I can tell, they left this in but made no mention of it to the player because it was a massive spoiler. Honestly kind of cool, although I really don't care for button commands in fighting games. The person that gave me all this information is Zatch Bell Gamer, and I'm pretty impressed with their work in all honesty. They have a channel where they work on retexturing most of the games in HD, as well as getting out translation guides and walkthroughs, and it's honestly a lot of hard work. They seem really dedicated to this IP, and it's kind of nice to see somebody stepping up and doing this sort of thing. I'm going to leave a link to their channel in the description. This video honestly wouldn't be anywhere near as good without them. They've actually convinced me that there's a lot more to talk about with this IP, so in lieu of adding that to this video and making it even longer, I'm just going to cover Electric Arena in the future. When I pick topics for Rose Tinted, I stick exclusively to games I have some type of past experience with, and while Electric Arena was on the list of a possibility, I wasn't really planning on doing it until now. And honestly, I'm glad I'm going to talk about this series again in the future, because yes, I have harped on some of the bad things it does, but for a battle shonen, the things I pointed out are really the only bad things. When I started to rewatch parts of this show for this video, I found it really easy to watch. A lot of times when I go back and watch things I used to like, I find them really cringy. Hell, I praise Soul Eater for its art style, but have you ever watched it recently? You used your magic to make Soul want to be with you. That's a dirty trick. You really are stupid. Huh? Any man would choose a girl with a body like Blair's over you and your flat chest. She didn't have to trick me to make me pick her instead of you. <laughs> now that you mention it, that witch does have a really nice body, doesn't she? <laughs> it would be best if you just shut up for a while. Yeah, it's just got that classic shonen cringe going on. Which kind of sucks, because I do genuinely think this series has great art, but that's another video. And it makes me kind of sad that this game is just above average, because I think Zatch Bell deserves better. I mean, if an IP that I honestly think is trash like Bleach can get one of the best licensed games I've ever played, why can't Zatch Bell? And you know what? I think that's why I couldn't remember this game. I had fun sorting through it and making this video, sure, but at the end of the day, despite having competent design at its core, it's nothing special. The core gameplay is really good, but it's everything else that surrounds it that falls flat. Now I need to explain how my rating system works. The way I rate things is anything below a 5 is bad, and anything above a 5 is good, while a normal 5 is... I have no strong feelings one way or the other. And with that, 
I'm going to give Zatch Bell Moto Battles for GameCube a 6 out of 10. If you're a big fan of the show or you find it for really cheap, it's good for some fun. But other than that, I wouldn't really bother as you can do much better. If you appreciated me covering this, don't forget to leave a like. And if you want to see what other games I talk about in the future, subscribe. Hope to see you guys next time. Oh my god, I'm finally done. I've been working on this video for like three months, man. Ah, I've got to do something easier for next time. Do, do I have something that will be shorter? Oh yeah, that'll definitely work. Miguel! Or Miguel!